All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our second screencast for Chapter 8. And in Section 8.2, we are going to be looking specifically at photosynthesis. Now, I think what we're going to do is we're going to actually break this one down into two separate screencasts. And so if you remember back in 8.1, we had talked about a molecule called ATP. Now, the only way that we can actually produce ATP is by making sure that we take in food. And in this case, for plants, the plants need to be able to make their own food. And when they make their own food, they make a molecule called glucose. Now, that glucose is important because it's going to provide energy within its bonds that will be used to actually help create this molecule right here. And again, that's the chemical form of energy that cells can use to carry out specific life processes. So in 8.2 we're going to look at photosynthesis and look at how this glucose is produced. So before we get too deep into our discussion of photosynthesis, it's really important that we make sure that we look at three separate scientists. Now these scientists were important in helping us to understand the process that we're going to look at in section 8.2. Now Jan van Helmont was really important because he allowed us to basically figure out that water was an important part of photosynthesis and he did this by making careful observations of a willow tree over a period of five years and what he did is he looked at the mass of that tree from year one to year five and he knows of course that the mass of that tree definitely increased well he was trying to figure out what actually caused the increase in that mass was it the water that he actually gave the tree was it the soil that he actually planted that tree in and after five years he determined that it definitely wasn't the soil because he noticed the amount of soil at the beginning and the amount of soil at the end was exactly the same so he concluded that it must have been a water that actually increased the mass of that tree now Joseph Priestley on the other hand he basically concluded that a plant is going to release oxygen and he did this by making observations um, during three different experiments. The first one was where he took a lit candle and placed it underneath a sealed bell jar. When he did this, of course, the flame went out because the flame basically used up the O2 that was found within the jar. In his second experiment, he did something a little bit different where he actually took a living organism, in this case a mouse, and he put it again within a sealed bell jar and the mouse, of course, used up the O2 that was within the jar, and of course, the mouse died. Now, his third experiment involved taking a plant, putting it in with the mouse, and what he had found was that within this sealed bell jar, the mouse had definitely lasted much longer. So his only conclusion here was that the plant must have produced oxygen, which allowed that mouse to survive. Now, Jan Ingenhouse, what he did was he took the information that he had seen in Priestley's experiment and took it a step further. He basically discovered that it was important for plants to be exposed to light in order to produce oxygen. And so he used aquatic plants in his experiments. When he put these aquatic plants in the dark, they did not produce as much O2. All right, so anyway, so these three scientists are really super important. I want you to think about these scientists as we make our way into um, the next slide, which is going to be looking at the actual chemical equation for photosynthesis. I want you to think about how these scientists contributed to that equation. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to think about those three scientists that we had looked at in our previous slide. I want you to think about their contributions to the chemical equation that you see right here. Now again, think about Helmont. Think about what he had done in regards to the idea that water was a contributing factor to the increase in the mass of that plant. Well, again, water is going to be an important part of this chemical equation. Think about Priestley. Think about his contribution in terms of oxygen being produced by plants. Think about Engine House. He had determined that in order for a plant to produce that oxygen, those plants have to be exposed to sunlight. Now this is a chemical reaction like any other chemical reaction. On the left hand side we have the reactants and on the right hand side we have the products. So in order for photosynthesis to occur we have to have a source of CO2 or carbon dioxide and that's the stuff again that we breathe out. We have to have a source of water. Those two things combined together 
are going to allow the plant to produce oxygen, which is what we use, of course, to survive, to breathe. And that plant is also going to produce glucose. And remember when we first started the screencast, we said that glucose was really important in helping us to create that ATP. So that glucose basically is the food the plant will produce. Now it says, note, photosynthesis is the process of making sugars and starches, not energy. All right, so we're making a molecule here. We are not making chemical energy. Now that's not to say that energy is not stored within those bonds, but at this point we are not utilizing that energy. The plant uses the sugars and the starches to make that molecule called ATP, which we had talked about back in section 8.1. Now in order for this plant to photosynthesize, we have to talk about a particular organelle called the chloroplast. Now think back to chapter 7. We had looked at both an animal cell and a plant cell, and remember one of the differences between the two was that plant cells have a chloroplast. And they have this special organelle because this organelle allows the plant to be able to make its own food. Now this chloroplast is made up of three different parts. It's made of something called a thylakoid, and down here towards the bottom you can see the thylakoids represented right here. And again, this was one of the things that we had used to recognize the difference between a chloroplast and a mitochondrion. Remember we said we saw these stacks of structures found within these chloroplasts. So it wasn't the zigzag pattern that you notice in a mitochondria, it was the stacked pattern. Well now you know these stacks are called thylakoids. And these are the membranes that are responsible for absorbing the visible light. So the light that you might get from an artificial source or it could be the light from the sun. And these thylakoids are going to contain a green pigment called chlorophyll. And that chlorophyll is going to help in absorbing that light. Now when you look at a stack of thylakoids like you see right here, this is called a grana. And this is where all of the light reactions are going to take place during photosynthesis. Now this third structure called a stroma, and you can see the stroma located right here, which is basically the empty space that you see in the chloroplast. This is going to be where the dark reactions will occur in photosynthesis. And we'll talk more about the difference between light reactions and dark reactions a little bit later in the screencast. So it's obvious that that chloroplast is really important when it comes down to photosynthesis for the plant. But what's even more important is the pigments that you're going to find within the thylakoids of that chloroplast. And as we had said, the chlorophyll is going to be that main light absorbing pigment. Now what you see down here towards the bottom, this is a representation of the light spectrum. Now remember white light, such as the light that's produced by the sun, is actually made up of lots of different colors. Uh, what we have here is we have two different types of chlorophyll being represented. We have chlorophyll A and we have chlorophyll B. And each type of chlorophyll is going to take advantage of a specific part of that spectrum. If you notice the blue line here represents chlorophyll A. And if you notice on the left hand side, chlorophyll A is going to basically absorb a lot of the violet range of this spectrum. Over here on the right hand side, the chlorophyll A is going to absorb a lot of the red part of that visible spectrum. Now chlorophyll B on the other hand is going to take advantage of a lot of the blue part of the spectrum and on the right hand side it's going to take advantage of a large part of the orange part of that spectrum. Now what you're going to notice is that in the middle where you see the green and the yellow parts of the spectrum neither type of chlorophyll will absorb these colors. Now, if they're not absorbing these colors, they're actually reflecting these colors. And that is the reason why plants are green to us, because they reflect the green color. They reflect some of the yellow color. They don't absorb them like they would the other parts of the light spectrum. So again, that's the reason why plants appear green to us. So earlier in the screencast, we had talked about two different sets of reactions that actually happen when you discuss photosynthesis. One of those sets of reactions is called light-dependent reactions, and the second set is called light-independent reactions. Now, if it's a light-dependent reaction, it must have light in order for it to proceed. If it's a light-independent reaction, no light is necessary. Now, sometimes these light-independent reactions are called the dark reactions, because again, light's not necessary. Now when you talk about the light dependent reactions like you see down here on the left hand side, it's important to understand that these reactions occur within the thylakoid 
of the chloroplast. So this that you see right here represents the chloroplast within the plant cell. Now again, remember the thylakoids are those stacks that you see within that chloroplast. And within those stacks we have the chlorophyll or that green pigment that is going to be used to collect the light energy from the sun or maybe some artificial light source. Now, using that light energy, that energy is going to be used to take the water that is given to the plant and actually break that water into two H plus ions and one oxygen atom. Now that oxygen is going to be released back into the atmosphere, so that's something definitely that we can take advantage of. And those H plus ions are going to be used to attach to another molecule called NADP. And don't worry about what NADP actually stands for, just understand that it's considered an energy electron carrier. Um, electrons basically represent energy and you have to have a way to carry them from place to place. Now this is important because it actually allows us to be able to take ADP and turn it back into ATP. And remember we do that by adding that phosphate to that molecule. So it goes from ADP, adenosine diphosphate, di means two, to adenosine triphosphate. Again, tri means three. Now when you make that ATP, it's really important because that allows us to be able to actually carry out the dark reactions that you see on the right hand side. Now these dark reactions actually occur within the stroma of the chloroplast. Now remember the stroma is that empty space that you see right here. Now in order for those to occur again, we have to have a source of energy because again, they're dark reactions, so there's no light energy to power these reactions. So it's going to take the ATP that was produced in the um, set of light dependent reactions, it's going to use that chemical energy, carry out these reactions, it's going to use some CO2 from the atmosphere. Again, we breathe out the CO2 and the plants are able to take this in. It's going to take in that CO2 and it's going to produce the food for the plant. Now remember the food for the plant is going to be the sugars. And again, those sugars are going to be important because they allow us to actually have the energy necessary to create ATP. So in our very last slide, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we look at a few factors that can definitely affect the rate of photosynthesis. Now when I say rate, I'm talking about how fast photosynthesis can occur. Now there's lots of different factors that can actually influence this, but the four that we're going to look at are water, temperature, how much light the plant is exposed to, and how much CO2 the plant has access to. Now water is a big part of this because if you think back to our equation, we have H2O plus CO2. Again, we've got to make sure we put some light in here. It's going to give us O2, oxygen gas, plus the food for the plant, which is going to be the glucose. If you notice, if you take that H2O out, you've taken out a big part of that equation. And remember, H2O is required for those light-dependent reactions that occur in the thylakoids of that chloroplast. Now temperature is also a big part and it comes down to the rate of photosynthesis. Now depending on the type of plant that you're looking at, most plants have enzymes which again participate in photosynthesis and these enzymes work best between a temperature of 0 to 35 degrees Celsius. Now if you look over here on the right hand side we have a graph that basically represents how um, the rate is affected when the temperature deviates from what we call that optimum or best range. And again, 0 to 35, this would be 0, this would be 35. In the middle, about 17, 18 degrees Celsius is probably considered your optimum range. If you go away from this, then the amount of photosynthesis occurring is going to decrease. Now light intensity of course is also going to be a big factor when it comes down to how fast photosynthesis occurs. I think most of us would um, reason that if you give a plant more light it's probably going to photosynthesize faster. But that's actually not always the case. If you notice over here on the right hand side again light intensity is represented at the bottom, the rate is on the left hand side. As you increase the light intensity up to about maybe this point, it is true the rate of photosynthesis definitely increases. But once you pass this point right here, which is sometimes called the sweet spot, you are going to get a plateau. Now when we say plateau, we're talking about an area where basically 
the rate will no longer increase. So you can give it more light, but that rate is going to stagnate. It's simply going to flatline. There's going to be no longer an increase in the rate of photosynthesis. Now CO2 works exactly the same way. If you notice down here towards the bottom, CO2, carbon dioxide, again, as you increase that CO2, you still have an increase in that photosynthetic rate, but once you pass that sweet spot, again, it's going to stagnate, it's going to plateau, it's going to flatline, which means you can give it more CO2, but it's no longer going to increase that photosynthesis rate. All right, so that's going to finish up our last screencast for 8.2. Again, please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.